Great. Well, we're filling up really fast, so I'm going to sort of crack on um, with sort of introductions and, and, and begin the meeting as people are continuing to filter through the waiting room, as, it, as it's called. Um, but I think we've got a fantastic, uh, a fantastic attendance tonight, so um, I'll get going. And um, first off, just to, to say hello and welcome. Um, welcome to the Labour Movement for Europe uh, Zoom meeting on the UK and EU relations. How can Labour supporters remain connected with e the EU progressive family? I think something we're all uh, very keen to, uh, to to think about in these in these difficult times. My name is Anna Turley. I'm the chair of the Labour Movement for Europe, and I'm uh, really proud to be part of this organisation, which is the Socialist Society, which is affiliated to the Labour Party for pro-Europeans, the home of pro-Europeans in the Labour Party. And obviously, this is a tough time for all of us. It's been a tough few years, obviously, as we've we've lost more battles than we uh, we would have liked to have done, and we wouldn't be. And none of us would wish to be where we are as a country, as a party, but we will keep the flame alive. Those of us that are here in this uh, online meeting, and it's really nice to be amongst friends and kindred spirits and uh, think about how we can um, keep the positivity and the hope and the connection and the partnership with our friends and neighbours uh, across the channel. Because that's for us, for me personally, that was always what um, a big part of what being part of the European Union was about. It was about solidarity. It was about cooperation. It was about partnership. And and um, we hope all of that will continue as we build on the, uh, the relationship that um, has been very difficult in recent times, but we hope we can be part of rebuilding that as we go forward. So thank you all so much for coming. We've got a fantastic um, group of speakers tonight. Um, I'm going to give them about uh, five minutes to speak and I'll be pretty uh, robust with them because obviously we've got a lot of people here and I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, they'll speak for about five minutes and then um, we'll open up to questions and answers after that. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll talk you through how to, to raise your hands and so on um, after after that so we'll head over to our speakers first and I'm delighted um, I'll run through who we've got we're, we're, I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Blomfield who was the shadow Brexit minister from 2016 to 2020 so he's seen it done it literally got the t-shirt and the scars and everything else but was uh, you know really fought hard for us um, from from the front benches um, in the Labour Party so we're delighted to have Paul with us tonight um, we've also got Laszlo Andor. Uh, Laszlo is the former EU Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, and he's now General Secretary of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, the FEPS think tank. I'm also delighted to be joined by my very good friend Jude Curtin Darling. Um, she's a former, former Labour MEP here for the North East. She's now Deputy General Secretary at the European Trade Union Industrial. And I know having worked with Jude on issues about steel, which is obviously, you know, we had a big campaign in this area to, to keep steel. Another of those issues that international partnership and working across borders gives us more power and strength uh, in, as, as we fight for our industry uh, around the world. So um, welcome to Jude. Um, I'm delighted also to welcome Anna Colombo. She was the former General Secretary of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, which is the political group in the EU Parliament, which Labour MEPs were part of, obviously, before Brexit. And I'm also delighted to welcome Giacomo Filibeck. Giacomo is the Deputy General Secretary of the Party of the European Socialists, PES, which the Labour Party still belongs to despite Brexit. So um, welcome to all of you. We're also hoping to have uh, Seb Dance here. Seb was a former MEP and Deputy Labour Leader in the EU Parliament. So we've got a fantastic panel um, and um, I'm going to give them all five minutes to say um, their thoughts and views and how we can we can work forward together. And then I'll be delighted to open it up to, to all of you. So Paul, over to you. OK, well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Anna. And I think it's a hugely important event and it's good to see so many people uh, come along. Um, the Labour Movement for Europe has always had an important role in the party, but it's uh, perhaps even more important as we navigate the uh, months and years ahead. Um, as we find ourselves, uh, as you say, we, I think we're all uh, Anna, bearing the scars um, of being not just outside the European Union, but out on Boris Johnson's terms. Uh, facing a hard Brexit, not only in terms of the economic relationship, but on security and on all the other uh, partnerships which were so important, down to the ludicrous level of uh, sort of banishing everything that has European in the title. We've got the European Health Insurance Card replaced by the Global Health Insurance Card, distinguished only by the fact it covers fewer countries and none of them outside Europe. Um, you said, Anna, and you're right, that um, you know, as a party, we've lost many times um, on Europe in recent years. The referendum, our attempts to mitigate the damage, uh, our calls for a people's vote. Uh, so we've been, we've been battered by Brexit. 
Uh, and I think we're all still coming to terms with it. Um, it is important that as a party, we find our voice on Europe. We need to recognize that it's not easy. The Tories want to continue the Brexit war to cement their new support that delivered them the result in 2019. Um, and as we see problems emerging from the deal, and we've seen many already, they will try to blame the EU. Uh, the Tory tabloids will join in and there will be a temptation to keep our heads down. But the truth is we can't hide from the issue. Brexit, as we know, isn't really done. There are all sorts of uh, talks continuing um, on financial equivalence, data adequacy, fishing. We've got the review coming up of the deal in five years time. So we have to be able to find our voice and talk confidently about Europe. I think a good starting point is to remember uh, our journey over the last four years. Let's remind ourselves we campaigned in 2016 to remain strongly, not strongly enough because we didn't win, but we made the case for our membership of the European Union in the interest both of our country and the continent that we share and will continue to share. And we didn't stop believing that when we lost, but we had to navigate the new terrain. And we spent four years trying to limit the damage, maintaining a close economic relationship, uh, seeking to uh, uh, replicate uh, customs union on similar terms to align with the single market, but also more widely arguing to maintain membership of the agencies and partnerships that we put together. Um, now, the, the 2019 election, the terms of our departure from the EU and the transition changed everything in terms of the situation that we're in, but it changed nothing in terms of our beliefs as a Labour Party. Now, that doesn't mean rerunning the arguments of 2016, because we are no longer members of the EU. It does mean that we have to make the case for Europe and our role as a European country, if no longer as an EU member. We need to recognise that even for a a country like the UK, there are only three choices in today's world. Alignment with the US, alignment with China, or alignment with, uh, with the European Union. Now, clearly there are some Tories who are desperate to sever the links. Their talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership is part of that, along with their talk of the, uh, the Anglosphere. We need to make it absolutely clear in the narrative that we build and the policies we develop, that we see our place firmly as part of the European um, model, if no, even as no longer members. And we've got lots to build on. Um, the red wall, the polling that uh, Best for Britain um, did with YouGov in some of the red so-called red wall seats, among those who voted to leave, even those voters and those who switched from the, uh, from Labour to the Tories at the last election, because of their uh, beliefs in Brexit, put the relationship with Europe as the most important one um, above the other choices facing us. I think that what we should be seeking to look for in the future is probably summed up by the amendments that I helped to draft and table with Keir to the future relationship bill on the 30th of December. And they were around the areas of um, looking at uh, the economic impact of Brexit, both in relation to goods and services, they were a, there was an amendment on um, access to the Schengen information system, but we were trying to make a wider point about maintaining um, our security partnership. There was an amendment on proposed divergence on employment and environmental standards, which goes to the heart of the European social model that we, uh, we were arguing for. An amendment on performers and artists permits, which um, was prescient in the context of what we've seen happen to that sector, but which was seeking to uh, open up a wider discussion um, about what future relationship we would have in terms of our, the ability of Brits to work within the EU and EU citizens to work within the UK. We also wanted to uh, continue participation in, uh, in Erasmus. And again, using that as a door to open a discussion about the other uh, programme areas. So. I think that kind of sets a framework for where we, we, we ought to be looking. Um, going further, looking for other areas of collaboration, but always making the case that we have a shared European history, shared values, shared interests. We need to be looking for the opportunities if we can still reflect that commonality um, going forward. 
And I think we need to remind people, remember, and we probably didn't do it well enough um, in the uh, referendum campaign, that the EU was not a foreign project <laughs> imposed on Britain. No, it was one that we helped to build over 47 years as members. We were the driving force behind the single market that the, the Tories are now so keen to leave. We helped to shape many of the regulations that they now want to diverge from. We helped to build the agencies that we've left. Now, we had a hugely important role in the European Medicines Agency, research programs and many of the other, many of the other projects. Now, there were things that were imposed on us um, after proper debate within, within the EU, workers' rights, um, environmental protection. The area that I represent, South Yorkshire, which is one of the poorest in Europe, benefited hugely from structural funds in a way that we will not um, in the future under the Tories' plans. So I think you know, as we go forward, we should, um, we should remember the commitments that uh, Keir made um, on the day that uh, Johnson announced his deal on Christmas Eve, that we will hold the Tories to account for their deal, for every day that they're in power. And we should use that deal as a platform from which we want to build a better relationship. I think that's a, that's a great starting point. We've just got to deliver it. Great, thank you so much, Paul. That's really, really, well, quite inspiring, really. This is, you know, this is all about how we kind of build back and, uh, you know, just a reminder of that shared history, shared heritage and shared values and the contribution we made to, to build the EU is, uh, I think, is really powerful. So um, I'm going to go next to Seb, who has uh, joined us. Seb Dance, as I said, was former MEP and Deputy uh, Labour Leader in the EU Parliament. So, um, Seb, are you, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi, Anna. Hi there. Uh, great. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Paul. That was brilliant. And um, I, I don't know if I've ever thanked you properly for the work that you did as a, as a shadow minister. And it was wonderful to have you there. Um, and, you know, uh, I, 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 I know that it's been a terrible, difficult time, um, but it was, it, was, it was really wonderful as, as an MEP. Uh, I, I think I can speak on behalf of the whole of the EPLP to know that we had um, you there. Uh, fighting for our values, really, and what we believe in, and, and to hear you espouse them now is uh, 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 is, uh, is just very fulfilling and, and and a wonderful thing for us to have. And it's and it's great to see. Sorry, I've just had some bad news, so I'm a little bit flummoxed. Uh, it, uh, my 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 father's dog has died, so I'm <laughs> a little bit upset. So apologies for uh, for that. Um, but um, it's wonderful to see so many uh, great faces uh, and uh, friends as well tonight. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just just a, a little bit of um, context in in terms of how I feel. Uh, you know, things have gone in a, in a direction that have sort of made us feel a little bit as if we're always on the losing side. Obviously, the referendum was a huge shock, uh, and you know, we campaigned hard for what we believed in, and um, we 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 fought every step of the way. I think for a lot of us the reaction to the referendum was in many ways harder than the referendum itself. Um, and I think that the ease with which um, uh, positions that have been thought of and taken for granted, I suppose, uh, as having been the mainstream in UK politics, the fact that they were abandoned so easily um, <laughs> was probably more of a shock, I think, than the loss of the referendum. So if you think even just five years ago, uh, which is an eternity now when you think everything we've, we've been through since, but just five years ago, it was the mainstream position of every single UK political party that, that, that the U, UK be a member of the European Union. Uh, it wasn't you know, a, a fringe idea. Uh, and now, of course, we struggle even to get the idea that one day the UK might rejoin. Like that is seen now in, 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 our, in our political context as such an extreme kind of um, view that, 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 that surely only a fringe minority could ever hold. And that's, that's kind of a, a real turnaround in fortune. Um, and, you know, I, I'm always struck by not just the speed of that turnaround, but I wonder what on earth would have happened in a country like France or Germany if they had had a similar referendum 
um, and there had been a, a very narrow victory for the Eurosceptic side, which of course uh, can and does happen in other countries. If you look at, uh, and I'm not an EU member, but when, when it was a referendum on the, single, on the single market membership in Switzerland, for example, it was a wafer thin, wafer thin majority in favour of uh, um, the Eurosceptic side. When you look at referendums in um, other member states on things like the um, uh, the, the constitution, the so-called constitution, the, Li the Lisbon Treaty and other treaties that, that have, have been rejected, in the, at least in the first instance, um, you know, you, you know that that Eurosceptic tide runs elsewhere as well. But I just can't help but think what, what a completely different reaction it would have been politically, in the media, in our wider society, if a country like Germany or France had taken uh, this path. Um, and I just, you know, one of the uh, extraordinary um, things that struck me was a commentator who described the end of the transition period is a bit like changing your gas supply. Like, you know, it's a bit disruptive, um, but ultimately, you know, what will really change? We'll get some new gas. It'll probably be more expensive and we'll want the old gas supplier. And I'm thinking that's just not, that's, no, it's actually like changing your gas supply for, you know, running off the local water mill instead and abandoning all your modern appliances and going back 200 years. Um, that's a better analogy, but I, it's, what, it struck, what struck me in all of this is that actually we are really disconnected from our near neighbours. We're disconnected in the way we think, uh, in our politics, in, in our media. Um, and, you know, no country can, in Europe can claim to be uh, wonderfully uh, internationalist and, and, and completely pro-European and, and, and not have an electorate to whom... You know, you have to deliver short term national priorities. Of course, that exists in every other member state of the European Union. Of course, it does. Um, but there is a sense of Europeanness uh, in other countries um, that really, you know, you have to fight and struggle to kind of remind people uh, in this country of, of, of what Europe is and what it does. So I really do think that, you know, we have to work very, very. Um, heavily on our links with not just our sister parties, but also the, the institutions that we're no longer a member of, um, linking through wherever we can, talking to um, expat groups, uh, people uh, 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 living in the UK who uh, are from the U27, also, of course, um, the Brits that we know, uh, and hi Jude, I can see you, uh, 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 who are living in the U27, uh, and keep those networks alive and that dialogue alive, because you know, one thing it's it's necessary to have, of course, is a bit of um, uh, institutional memory. But, you know, we're in a campaign now. We're in a campaign for the very soul of the country. I personally do not think Brexit has a chance of being sustainable, certainly not in its current form. Now, that, that's maybe another discussion. But as part of that campaign, we have to have um, critical support from our, our friends in the EU27 as well. So my appeal really to... Um, everyone in the EU27 is when the Labour Party is being a bit reticent, uh, when um, it forgets perhaps uh, what is happening in the European Union and the benefits of having been in the European Union and what our sister parties are doing in the European Union, please be a critical voice and speak up and say that the Labour Party needs to do more to reconnect with its sister parties. You don't have to say, oh, we want the UK back in the EU. Obviously, that would be nice. But, you know, it, it's not about that at the moment. It's about saying, look, there is a family of nations. There is a political family. And we really want the Labour Party to be a part of that and to feel a part of that. Uh, one day, obviously, we hope to welcome you back. But until then, please just play a part and, and engage with us. And I think at this, this stage, that voice from our, our partners in the EU27 would be the most useful thing that we could hear right now. Thank you, Seb. That was great. And, and thank you in particular for all the work that you did as well. You did a terrific job and also, uh, you know, campaigning so passionately and telling truths about Farage as well, <laughs> which will never be forgotten. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll hand over now to Laszlo Andor. Um, as I said, Laszlo is the former EU Commissioner for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion, and uh, we're delighted to, to have him with us, Laszlo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be uh, here and um, being part of this distinguished panel. Uh, listening to the previous speakers, I realized that I'm here in three capacities. Uh, first of all, as a Hungarian, and uh, secondly, indeed, as a former commissioner. And my current capacity is uh, being the head of the 
a main progressive think tank in Brussels, um, which is abbreviated as FEBS. If you haven't heard much about FEBS, I put um, the link to our website into the chat box so you can open it and find um, uh, some details. But why did I highlight uh, the Hungarian dimension? Um, it is because there was life um, before the Brexit referendum and, um, and um, the time when um, the Central East European countries were just dreaming about EU membership. And indeed, uh, we already spotted at that time that the United Kingdom, for whatever reason, was mainly pro-enlargement. And I think um, uh, people in Hungary, in Poland, in other countries of uh, this region um, will continue to remember uh, that when some other countries, some other nations might have been more ambivalent about um, the enlargement of uh, the European Union uh, for uh, maybe sometimes tactical, strategic, but also kind of geopolitical and historic reasons, I think the uh, British governments, uh, including probably both Major as well as Tony Blair, understood um, the importance. Uh, but obviously most of this was uh, negotiated um, under uh, Tony Blair. Um, the, the, the whole negotiation process uh, launched uh, when um, you had a foreign secretary called Robin Cook and, um, and um, it, it became a dynamic process um, and created the conditions of uh, um, a, a period when, um, first of all, economic growth and prosperity became serious after, uh, well, um, a, a, a very painful transition process to the market economy in the early 1990s. Let's not forget that. Um, and um, and uh, uh, we, we, we received all different types of assistance. Uh, um, I should also recall that the ambassador of the EU to my country was um, a British journalist, um, uh, Michael Lake, and um, he was extremely friendly and engaging and, um, and um, uh, helping um, um, all of us um, who were young at the time uh, to, to, to develop a better understanding of uh, the functioning of uh, the EU and integrate um, as well as we could. So as compared to that, um, and I come to the second point, of course, um, I always found it a little bit ironic that while the UK uh, was uh, you know, very forthcoming to help the accession of the East Central European countries, um, when um, some representatives of these countries arrived uh, to the UK labor market, they became some kind of scapegoats. So the Polish worker and uh, some other uh, East Europeans, Romanians, who might have been you know, visibly um, worse off um, than the British population, um, became targets of um, all different types of accusation that these people would be coming for uh, for you know, taking advantage of the very generous welfare state of the UK, which, um, as we know, is not extremely generous and, and became uh, you know, less and less generous um, under um, the, the, the Tory governments um, of the last uh, um, about 12 years. Uh, nevertheless, um, somehow, you know, the tabloid press, um, the more right-wing uh, 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 elements in the Tory party and the previous government um, found it very, very important to, to, to find scapegoats in, um, uh, in, in these EU migrants. And, um, and, and this uh, fit very well in um, uh, the paradigm, which I think was um, one of the important ones, uh, which unfortunately resulted in the referendum outcome in 2016, which simply is about uh, blaming the European Union and all different parts um, of the European Union uh, for the failures of British capitalism. For the fact that there is growing inequality in the UK, there is growing regional divide, very stubborn regional divide um, inside uh, the UK, um, and um, and um, 
uh, you, know, you, you, you can always find a scapegoat in the Brussels bureaucracy, which allegedly is, um, is tying the hands of British business and so on and so forth. And um, uh, I must say that you know this uh, discourse uh, at my time as a commissioner was you know really uh, uh, disturbing. At the same time, let me also highlight that with all the MEPs, uh, predecessors of uh, Judith and Seb, uh, we have been working um, very well together uh, with Stephen Hughes on you know health and safety dossiers and the posted workers. Uh, with Derek Vaughan, um, uh, who, who, who capacitated me to go to Wales, uh, which I did, and uh, saw how well they were using uh, uh, the European Social Fund for training the young people at the time of uh, the crisis, which was badly needed, um, also, uh, also in Wales, uh, with Richard Howitt, with whom we went to see the food banks, because unfortunately in 2013, the UK was increasingly needing food banks, which in my view was a shame. Um, and it was an even greater shame that the Tory government refused to use uh, the European money, uh, which was available for supporting uh, the food banks, but somehow they, they denied this option. So uh, uh, that's probably enough for, from licking the wounds. Uh, let's look ahead. And in my third capacity as uh, the Secretary General of uh, FEPS, I'm happy to uh, highlight the excellent cooperation we have had and we continue to have with uh, the progressive think tanks of uh, Britain. Uh, probably I should start uh, the list with the Fabian Society, um, which is much older than us, um, obviously, uh, but we have regular events, including the one uh, recently in January, um, uh, to which we bring um, MEPs uh, from the continent, various speakers who also uh, last time um, uh, brought some added um, uh, analysis on the European Green Deal or um, uh, the ideas about you know, reshaping the European integration in the coming years in the light of the coronavirus uh, uh, recession. Uh, so, uh, we have had a, a, a long list of common publications with the Fabian Society, but also uh, with the uh, Policy Network, uh, where I think um, the, the activities are going to revive in the coming period. IPPR is an observer of uh, FEBS, but we have good uh, relations and a keen interest in uh, studying uh, um, especially what they have produced on economic justice um, in the recent uh, period. Uh, Mutuo has been a member, uh, the cooperative uh, think tank, and two university research centers, Sperry in Sheffield and um, also in Greenwich uh, uh, G. Perk, um, which, for example, is excellent on studying income inequality and wage uh, dynamics. So, you know, um, the last thing we would need is a kind of disconnect as a consequence of Brexit. I think uh, when it comes to the cooperation um, uh, with uh, the UK progressive think tanks, um, uh, Brexit simply doesn't matter. We can continue as before. And we are very, very happy, uh, you know, uh, for example, Roger Little being a member of our scientific council, uh, together with Patrick Diamond um, and, uh, and uh, continuing the joint work for, for the recovery and uh, some kind of revival of uh, social democracy in Europe as a whole and not simply inside the European Union. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laszlo. That's um, you know, it's really positive sort of reinforcement of not just of our past but also our future together as well. And, and thank you for uh, you know, for setting that out so clearly. Um, I'm going to call Jude Curtin Darling now, who, um, as I said, was a former MEP and is now De Deputy General Secretary at uh, Industrial. Jude, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Anna, and um, thanks very much uh, to LME for the invitation uh, to be here this evening. It's really lovely. It's really also lovely to see so many names in the participants list from the northeast so um uh it's uh it's great to be amongst you i guess um i'm one of those uh people who were left um on the the other side of the the channel when uh, the uk left um the eu and and here i 
and bringing also a perspective of um, civil society and the the, late, the broader labor movement, the trade union movement, and the, the importance of links um, beyond uh, the, the party. Um, and I think what's important to say um, at the beginning is that when we left the EU, in, the EU political institutions, when Seb and I uh, left the parliament on the 31st of January, uh, last year and when we left the transition period um, on the 1st of January this year, um, we didn't leave much of European civil society. Uh, British organisations are still major players in lots of the European associations and lots of European level um, organisations um, coordinating in, in different fields and that's definitely the case in the trade union movement where our movement has never been an EU um, membership based movement. It's been a continent wide movement, bringing together workers um, from Iceland to Turkey. Um, and now having within the European trade union movement, um, we have uh, nearly half of our membership, not quite half, but a bit less, um, outside uh, the EU um, as well, or a big membership outside the EU as well as the, the members um, inside the EU. So um, for the trade union movement, um, Brexit is, has been a, a long and very difficult story. I think it's worth saying um, that um, over the last um, four or five years, we've seen incredible solidarity from trade unions elsewhere in the European Union towards the British trade union movement and towards British workers. It's been through um, a combined effort uh, that the whole question of level playing field and labor rights, um, it, we can say there are lots of problems with the, the Brexit deal, but the fact that uh, labor rights um, were maintained as a political issue right until the end of the negotiations is largely as a result of that mobilization um, across Europe and the, uh, the very strong positions that trade unions in other member states, the European unions, took towards their governments. Um, now that we know the, the terms of the changed relationship, um, in a way, much of the work in the trade union movement is starting now, uh, because it's now that many of the uh, major challenges and uh, the, the threats opposed to that solidarity and um, internationalism, which has been uh, so important over, over many years. Um, that The point that we start from, uh, from the, the level of the ETUC and in working with our, our member organizations inside the European Trade Union Federations, like Industrial Europe, uh, where I'm now Deputy General Secretary representing manufacturing, energy and mining workers across Europe, is that we are um, now trying to ensure that that political unity within our membership um, continues into the future. And that means an enormous effort in terms of resources and capacity to manage how the um, Brexit deal rolls out in practice in workplaces um, and along supply chains and in different sectors. Um, multinationals um, and uh, and others are obviously watching for the divisions which, we, which can be created. An example of this is that already we're hearing uh, reports from companies which have European works councils, which are um, basically uh, information and consultation bodies, which cover the full European um, workforce of big multinational companies that uh, already a number of, of multinationals are looking at how they can get rid of their British representatives in European works councils. Um, now that the UK is outside uh, the, the, the legal framework, despite the fact that European works council legislation has been transposed into UK law and still remains on the statute book in the UK. So that that solidarity that I'm talking about is a very practical solidarity on the ground in workplaces between shop stewards in a, a large number of companies that we, we coordinate. Within industrial Europe, we coordinate something like 600 European works councils. Um, all of the big names that you can imagine in manufacturing largely have these structures. Um, and 
And this is just in terms of capacity for the trade union movement, an enormous challenge to try and, and, and manage these um, relations into the future and to maintain um, and the acquired rights to try and defend the seats of British shop stewards uh, where they have them and to continue to, to push for their participation. And in the best um, companies, uh, that, is, uh, that is the case that though the companies have recognized that it's better to keep the uh, British seats on board to ensure um, uh, a good industrial relations culture in the companies. Others have decided um, differently. So um, tomorrow, as a very concrete example, I will be uh, sitting in my attic in Brussels. Uh, we never move anywhere anymore, but I will be uh, leaping from, uh, from meeting with you today to a full meeting of the works councillors of Vigi Metal, where they want to hear in detail exactly what the Brexit deal means for them in different sectors, and also how they can defend the rights of the British shop stewards in the um, information and consultation structures where they sit. This is an enormous commitment from trade unions across Europe to defend their sister um, unions and their, their fellow workers in the UK. And that's because um, we've got to be honest, an attack on workers' rights in the UK is the start of a downward spiral. And workers across Europe know that if there is a competitive pressure put on terms and conditions, through the deregulation of labor rights and the social chapter in the UK, then that will put an enormous pressure on um, those rights also across the rest of the European Union. So there is a self-interest from the um, European side to engage and to maintain that strong um, cooperative relationship also with the British uh, trade unions. That appetite is, is really there um, and it, but it, I'm not going to uh, be naive. There are enormous challenges, especially in a period of COVID, where we've seen enormous uh, production cuts, um, the natural tensions between workers within sectors where there is contraction play out. Brexit is part of that discussion in many companies. So there are lots of tensions, which as trade unionists, we are trying to um, manage and ensure that uh, we don't fall into the hands of populists and nationalists, and we uh, promote those uh, core values on which our, our movement has been built. And um, I'll maybe finish with one very concrete example, Anna. Uh, when the FT did a leak at the beginning of January, you know, the ink on the agreement was not dry. Um, the FT front page said uh, that there was a review of European um, employment legislation in the UK. Uh, that the working time directive was in the sights of uh, the government uh, to, to repeal it. We've always known that they would come first for the working time directive. The Tories, especially the Fresh Start Tories, uh, the Unchained Britannia um, crew, they absolutely loathe the working time directive with a passion. So we knew they were coming for it. But when that leaked, the response on this side of the channel was enormous trade unionists calling their governments, calling their employment ministers, calling Michel Barnier, saying this is entirely unacceptable. The UK government cannot walk away from the level playing field and from European workers' rights, and the European Commission must, must step up. Now, that's a challenge for the European Commission because they clearly want to defend, uh, and Laszlo, close your ears perhaps, but clearly want to defend uh, the um, uh, competition rules at European level, very actively, avoiding unfair state aid, avoiding unfair competition. That we always expected that the labor standards would be further back in the priority list. But that popular mobilization produced a very strong reaction from Michel Barnier in the European Parliament, saying absolutely no way that we will accept this deregulation. And that demonstrated to us in the trade union movement that the only way that we can collectively defend our rights on both sides of the channel is if we are watching eagle-eyed what happens um, in the UK, not just announcements from government, leaks in the FT, but what's happening in workplaces in the UK, how companies are behaving, and then using that information to then apply political pressure on the Brussels side of the, the relationship 
to ensure that we uh, really see solidarity and internationalism in action. That's what we're doing in the European trade union movement. Um, our British um, affiliates are very important um, to us and, uh, and it's a sign of uh, the value that uh, unions across uh, Europe put in British affiliates that they um, nominated and elected a British Deputy General Secretary just six months um, after Brexit to say that they wanted a Brit leading a European organisation um, for, on, for manufacturing workers. So uh, there is an engagement from here and we need to strengthen that relationship and we need to see the all, not just the Labour Party as part of the, the story about um, maintaining strong links. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Jude. Thanks. That was fascinating. And it's, and it's actually really assuring, reassuring in so many ways that there is so much collaboration, participation and, you know, the movement is still there. You know, for those of us who, you know, we're in the Labour Party because we believe in, you know, workers' rights across borders and across boundaries and uh, the fact that that work is still going on is really important really valuable and um, you know we have to make the case here in this country about why it's better for working people um, and I think you know sadly we failed to, to make that case too often in the past um, but moving on next um, I'd like to welcome Anna Colombo as I said Anna is the um, uh, former General Secretary of the uh, Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats um, which was of course the political group that we were part of so Anna over to you. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, it's a terrific meeting with the terrific uh, attendance. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to go through the list and I couldn't, of course, uh, go through the whole list, but I saw Glenis Wimmelt, Belinda Pike, Francis Jackers, David Poyser, Richard Corbett, all uh, Jumpy and all those who spoke uh, before me, and it's it's a great emotion. I I must say because I, I believe I'm the first non-British speaker, and uh, I have to say that uh, Brexit was a shock yes. for me too. Um, for for yes. hello, yes, for uh, for yeah, a, yeah. Yes. I think it's, I think it's going better. Okay. Yes, for at least three reasons. The first one was that, that I said it before to the other speakers. I joined the, the European Parliament in 87 and I was uh, welcomed in the socialist group family by um, Julian Priestley. Then I had Pauline Green from the cooperative labor movement as a president of the group. And my, let's say, main, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, professional career was uh, dealt with uh, the transport sector with Brian Simpson as a spokesperson and subsequently on employment and social affairs with Stephen Hughes, uh, uh, John Monks in the <laughs> TUC uh, Secretary General and, uh, and Recently, together with Judith and also together with Seb, we worked uh, uh, so much not only on the, as we did with Stephen News, with the, the big mass of the uh, uh, social uh, uh, legislation in Europe, uh, all the directive, uh, health and safety at work, uh, the fight on the, on the uh, working time directive where the EPAP had the guts to stick to the point of uh, the international political family to defending and vote for the working time directive in a moment where the Labour government would have liked to have it otherwise. But then we said, and together with others, we worked to have our political family, the group and the party, successfully campaigning in 2019 uh, to take the UN Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals of a different model of development, a social, ecological and different economic model of development as the basis for the future of Europe. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> a final point, to see that the 31st of January <laughs> of last year, which is my birthday, <laughs> the Labour EPLP had to leave the European Parliament since then, this year, 31st of January, for me was not my birthday, but the first one year after our Labour family in, in the European Parliament, and uh, it's very sad. I would like to say that the COVID was uh, a, an incredible proof for our uh, European Union. Uh, let's be clear, on this crisis, the European Union co could have broken 
its neck. And thanks to us, and thanks to what we had put in place as conditions to vote for the new commission uh, with our all commissioners in 2019, uh, we were able to, to change and, and to start a completely different Europe, uh, much more human, uh, social, ecological, and stronger solidarity. Now, um, to come to the point to see in which way this Europe can continue, because this is just the beginning of the fight, to build a continent where no one is left behind, which is one of the reasons, sadly, for Brexit too, I think that we have to continue to work all together. And I will give you immediately two or three um, very pragmatic suggestions. The first one is that, uh, as Judith uh, very quite rightly said, what uh, the future of the deal between the European Union and, and, and the uh, UK will offer to us is still unknown, uh, in particular in the level playing field, the social, environmental and uh, taxation level playing field. There we have to remain extremely vigilant, working together, of course, with the trade union movement, but in the partnership council, there will be a parliamentary assembly. So I think this is the first point where we can have a very pragmatic uh, cooperation amongst us. The second, where we can also imagine, uh, I have been following the chat, which is very lively and very quick, but I think that is the place where we might want to think about the single market, about the custom union, about Erasmus+. Plus. The second um, aspect, also taking into account the change at the head of the VTO and the fact that the now trade agreement must aim at a different model of development, so no race to the bottom. The second element, which is I look at Jambi because I think is the most pragmatic point where we might need some action. I think that our group, our parliamentary group, unfortunately, cannot have uh, British members anymore, but I think that we can cooperate further. We have uh, a, an important number of extra parliamentary activity, conferences, seminars. We, we recently, together with the other actors uh, at the European level, we launched uh, the Child Union campaign. We launched uh, the Affordable Housing campaign. In the Affordable Housing campaign seminar, I invited Teresa Griffin, for instance, who was uh, very active during a year in the European Parliament uh, against energy poverty. And there, if you have working groups yourself, where you could suggest expert to integrate every time this kind of uh, uh, happenings, it would be very good to maintain the links with you. Um, I think it's also very important, uh, and Giacomo will say, uh, luckily, you are still full member in the Party of European Socialists, but it's interesting to see also what happens uh, at the international level. For instance, in the Progressive Alliance, the Progressive Alliance uh, launched the, uh, last week a powerful campaign for international solidarity in vaccination. It would be great if the Labour movement and the Labour Party could join that call. And, uh, and then I stay, but I, I finish here, I think that Richard Corbett might have a lot to say about that. I think that we have to find a way and I will try to push in that direction, also because my function at the moment is the one to sort of um, work with external partners in the secretary of the group. I think that for many reasons, and also for reasons to learn lessons, you should be involved in, uh, at, at all possible uh, level in our debates as a group and as a political family on the future of the European Union and the Conference for the Future of Europe. I stop here and then if there is the occasion to answer some question, I will continue. Thank you, Anna, really appreciate that. And thank you for, you know, that I'm, I'm always constantly amazed how many of our European friends and colleagues um, continue to remain so open-hearted and open-handed uh, to us after everything for the last few years. So that is appreciated, thank you. Um, and our final speaker of the evening um, is Giacomo Filibeck. Um, Giacomo, we're delighted to welcome you. He's uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the Party of the European Socialists. Over to you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to the Labour Movement for, uh, for the EU, for Europe. 
thanks to Jampi for uh, having uh, invited us as part of European Socialists to be part of this uh, of this debate. My connection is not great, neither is my English. So I hope we will manage to to go through in the next few minutes without major uh, major confusion. Uh, I would just like to share with you one story, uh, precisely on the basis of what Anna just uh, raised: the full membership of the U of the UK Labour in uh, in PES, in the Party of European Socialists. Just in these days, Laszlo Andor from FEPS can confirm it. We are in the middle of a negotiation with the European Commission on reviewing the rules and regulation for funding for European parties and European political foundations. Because the current rules and regulation practically states that it's kind of complicated to interact on the basis of a full fledged membership of European political families with parties coming from third countries, so from non-EU states. Now, there are many other items and issues in this rules and regulation book that we may would like to review and revisit and rewrite. But there is one argument with which we start any kind of conversation, be it within the parliamentary group, be it with representatives of the European Commission. And it is the party of European Socialists will never accept that we cannot have and hold with full rights and full capacity of participating and contributing to the life of the European Socialist family, the UK Labour Party. It's, it, there is no question. We know that Brexit happened, but it never happened for us politically. It never happened for us as a political family. And it's not only because we are internationalists, but it's because we believe that the European Socialist and Social Democratic Party without the UK Labour Party, it's, it's like losing one major part of your body, uh, one major organ. So uh, there is one thing you can all be sure, the current leadership of PES will always keep this line, no matter what rules and regulation try to impose on us. If we have to create a special category of membership for the UK Labour, we will do it. it. It's out of question that there is a disconnection. Subdance was speaking about disconnected. That word stayed with me for a while. And this is exactly what we will never want to allow to happen. A disconnection, a political, a sentimental, a moral disconnection between our political family in Brussels and in all the other capitals and, and the UK labor movement. On this, you can, uh, you can be confident. Then I would like to conclude by quoting uh, Richard Corbett, uh, very good uh, friend and great example of uh, UK labor MEP in the past years. And not only that, uh, when he says in his, uh, in his comment, now I'm not going to go word by word, but it's practically inviting everyone not to give up. I mean, uh, it's not necessarily the destiny of the UK forever to stay out and conditions can be created for a change. Uh, if that happens and, I, and we want as best to help for these conditions to be in place, then my only request to you is please allow us as Europeans to campaign with you for getting back in. Because we wanted to campaign with you back in the first referendum. All the leadership of all the member parties of the European Socialist and Social Democratic family were ready to do it. It was decided that this was not going to be uh, the best way uh, to, to take part in this, uh, in this referendum. 
So we stayed out. Next time, give us a chance to give you a chance <laughs> to win it. Because, because it's a common destiny that we have all together. And we are unanimous on this side of the continent. Uh, there is no doubt about it. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jack. I, mean, I feel quite emotional <laughs> after hearing that because, you know, it's it's for those of us that share those values. It's felt a very kind of isolated struggle here in the country, and it's been very hard to watch a country that you thought you knew what the values were that your your country represents sort of feel drift away. And you know, for me, the Labour Party is a party of solidarity, of internationalism. It's outward facing. It's proud. It's progressive, and it works in partnership and cooperation with people. And um, that's always for me been been what brings the Labour Party and the European Union close together. So those values haven't gone anywhere. Um, and part of what we've said is our mission in the Labour movement for Europe here at the LME is to make sure that the Labour Party never again uh, abandons those values and abandons um, those things that we think are, are at the core of what we stand for and what we believe in. So um, we'll continue to fight for that. And we're extremely grateful for your solidarity and um, for your being there with us um, for whatever that holds in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, fantastic speakers. I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, and we're going to go uh, open up to questions now. Um, we've got half an hour left in this discussion. So um, we'll try and get as many of you in as possible. Some people have already messaged me in advance. Um, so I'm just going to kind of try and get them in as quickly as I can first. And then everybody else, I'd ask you if you could go to participants at the bottom of your screen and there's an option there to raise your hands and I'll try and work through as many of you as possible. I'm not going to do this too much like a question and answer back to the panel because obviously we have a big panel as well anyway so what I'd just like to hear from as many of you as we can fit in in that time and then I'll come back to the panelists at the end for some concluding comments so um, I've already got quite a big list as it is so bear with me um, but the uh, first up we had um, Martin Phillips so um, Martin I think I can ask Ask you to unmute and then you should be there Martin. I think I've unmuted myself. Um, I, I, it's interesting watching the chat there was conversation about should we be campaigning to rejoin now or not. My, my own sense from speaking to members, party members who aren't in LME as well as the wider public is that there isn't an appetite yet to uh, for Labour to campaign to rejoin let's say in the 2024 manifesto, but there is definitely interest in rejoining some of the institutions, particularly the single market and the customs union. So how do we keep the future relationship with the EU on the agenda without making um, the more enthusiastic people for rejoining think that a 2024 pledge uh, is going to happen? Great, good question, thanks. So if everyone kind of parks that and, and I'll ask the speakers at the end to respond to whichever ones they want to, to respond to. So people who email me in advance, um, Glenis Wilmot. Um, Glenis, are you here? Let me, yes, I think I've got you asked to unmute. This should work. Have you unmuted me? Yes. That's it, are you there? Yep, yes, great. I'm here. Uh, hello everyone, good to see you all. Good to see so many friendly faces. Um, the first thing I want to say is uh, without causing a civil war in our own party, we first of all have to persuade our own party that we should be arguing to uh, have a close relationship with Europe or, you know, I would prefer to rejoin the EU, but, you know, let's get a closer relationship in the first instance. But we can't set off a civil war because what we have to do is win an election. But having said that, I think it's going to be an uphill struggle at the moment because there are some in our party who think it's toxic just to even think about it and we have to try and change that mindset. I'd like to see us have a much closer relationship with a socialist group in the European Parliament than we do at the moment. I think Anna was right. There are many uh, bodies like FEPS and, and, and like the PEZ and, and, and the, the pan-European trade union movements that we can work with but also we need to have a close relationship with the group in the European Parliament. I think that would be very helpful. But I'd like to know how we really get our own party in the first instance. We have never really argued for a pro-European stance, no matter who was in power, even when we've had other leaders, Tony Blair, 
Uh, although he was pro-European, we never made a successful case for Europe because we chose to use it as a whipping boy when it was necessary. And we didn't give credit where credit was due. And we have to stop that mindset, first of all. I don't know how we do that, but we've got to start arguing the positive case for Europe. And until we do that, we stand no chance. But I would like to see a much closer working relationship with the socialist group. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Glenis. That's great. Really agree. Thank you. Um, next up, I'm going to invite Richard Corbett to, to speak. Richard, are you there? Yes, but I, I hadn't indicated that I wanted to speak. Oh, sorry. I had you on my list in advance. Apologies, no, but okay. I'm sure yeah. you I'm I have. Sure I have to go in a few minutes. So, OK, but I set out some views in the chat. So great. OK, that's fine. Then no problem. Um, so next up, um, Linda Gilroy. Linda. Um, let me unmute you. There we go. Hi. Yeah, well, I think there's been some really good ideas in the, the chat. And I, I just think stuff's going to start emerging, as Richard said, from um, things as they go wrong. And we need to turn those into positive campaigns. But one that's coming up on the horizon, that I'd be really interested to hear any um, feedback from um, our European uh, guests particularly, is we've got COP26 coming up. Um, is there an agenda there that we can push forward, uh, push the ambitions forward further um, than we're likely to otherwise see? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I've, next up, Don Brind. Don? Um, I... Um, I didn't indicate I wanted to ask a question. Oh, Since you've got a hugely long list, I'll. I'll oh, that's keep fine. My no problem. Right another time. Yeah. Great. I'll go um, next up. Then was Dennis McShane. Dennis. Oh, that should. I'm out. It's ah. telling. Oh, there we go. Yep. We, we're still not. We haven't got you, Dennis. I'm afraid. Oh, that's it. Yeah. There you the, go. Am I good now? We've got you. Yeah, there you are. Great, great, great. OK, a couple of sort of just contrarian points. Uh, uh, number one, too many of the people in this wonderful gathering, I mean, 300 plus people, it's one of the greatest webinars I've seen for Labour on Europe for a long time. But I think we're all, we've all been vaxxed. Or well, probably not you, Anna, you're, you're, you're far too young. But <laughs> uh, we need to get, not us, but a new generation involved. Stop lamenting the past, stop saying what a great time we all worked together. It wasn't all, it wasn't all wonderful. There were terrible things done to Greece, Portugal, other countries by the Commission in the last decade. Um, that's where an awful lot of support went out of the window. That's why I wrote a book in 2014, Brexit, How Britain Will Leave <coughs> Europe. It wasn't being clairvoyant. I just knew it in my bones. Second point is, can we demolish the Red Wall myth? <coughs> the idea that the 60-odd seats we lost were all because of Brexit. I was a Red Wall MP for 18 years, and at any election, half of my voters didn't vote Labour. They voted Tory, UKIP, BNP, Lib Dem, Independent, Pakistani, Kashmiri, whatever. <laughs> because of first past the post, I became the MP. And what we really have to say is the majority of Labour voters did not vote for Brexit. And we're making an historic error, in my view, in thinking we can win any election by appealing to shabby <coughs> English nationalism. And the final tiny point is, can we, I'm all with Jude, I used to work for International Metal Trade Union for many years. <coughs> I like European cooperation, I like works councils. They don't m matter an awful lot with voters, and that's what matters to us. So can we create a kind of pro forma template if we can find some activists, anybody in some constituencies, not all, that could say this is how Brexit is hitting us, hitting our small importers, our small exporters, our farmers, our um, obviously all the university people. 
all the travel agents, all the people who hope to retire or buy a second home in Spain or France or Italy or wherever, and that's almost going to be out of the window, and produce a constituency level report of how it hits people, uh, Anna, in, in Redcar, in Darlington, in, in Rotherham or wherever. And I think we can start to get the story down locally. We can start to make some progress. But we just sit talking about the wonderful offer from Jacobo, we'll all be friends of the PES forevermore. That's great. I love it. Part of my history and belief. But you've got to get down and talk to people at the grassroots and find some new and younger people to do the talking for us. That's great. Thanks, Dennis. I think you're absolutely right. And it's one of the things we want to do moving forward at the LME is have a real sort of um, information gathering about all the effects that we're seeing that, you know, you see it all over Facebook or newspaper articles, but pulling that together cohesively. And then, as you say, putting it into a constituency um, approach will be really, really interesting work. So thank you. Dan McCurry next. Dan. Well, my question really is, um, has the, has the culture war ended and the economic war begun? Because Keir Starmer made this sound argument. He said, um, this is a culture war. Whenever Labour tries to fight it, we get hurt. So the best thing to do is just not engage with the argument whatsoever. However, Brexit has now happened. It happened on the 1st of January of this year, not before that. And we've seen chaos, chaos, chaos. Even Michael Gove, Michael Gove was one of the most vocal critics of Brexit in recent times. You know what happened today? He got sacked because he's not sufficiently compliant. So Lord Frost has taken his job, guess what, as a Brexit negotiator. I thought, I thought Boris Johnson was elected to get Brexit done. Not to continue a forever Brexit negotiation going on and on and on. So Gove has been sacked, but you know what? Keir Starmer and the Labour PLP would never get sacked because they are compliant. What we should be doing, our campaign, should be persuading them that the culture war has ended, the economic war has begin, begun, and that sound argument, which was a sound argument, but we get hurt by Brexit because it's a culture war, that no longer stands true. Right now, we should be out there pointing out that shellfish is being destroyed, the music industry is being damaged, the city of London is shifting to Amsterdam, etc, etc, etc. There should be three words to stick with in our campaign. Attack, attack, attack. And I suggest that this is what our organisation should do. We should persuade Keir Starmer and the PLP that things have changed and we need to change with them. Thanks, Thank Alex. you, Dan. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Liam Conlon next. Hello, hello. Hi, Anna, as well. Hi, yeah. How are you? Yeah, um, very good. Thanks. Nice to see you. Very good. So, look, I mean, um, I'm, I'm also chair of the Labour Party Irish Society. And um, for me, the greatest uh, MEP in history was John Hume, uh, the Nobel laureate. And my dad's from Port Ferry in County Down. My parents ran a pub in Newry on the border during the Troubles. Um, and John Hume said that the EU was an institution of peace. And... It was fundamentally about bringing people together. It helped facilitate the Good Friday Agreement when the single market was created in 1993, softened the edges of difference uh, between different communities. And that European identity, I think, um, exists far beyond the EU. One of the things that I think I agree with that Seb raised today is that, you know, we, we have left the EU and there is a need to move on in, in that regard. Um, I also don't think that it's, um, constructive or productive politics to just call on other people to do things for you all the time. Um, and one of the things Seb said was, we need to work with sister parties and institutions to keep dialogue alive. And I'd be really interested to hear from some of the um, ME, former MEPs and some of the people from um, like Laszlo and others, what do you think those forums are and how, how, what is the best way to work together? Great, thank you so much. Um, Oscar Avery next. Hi. Uh, so I, I'm a councillor in the, the northeast of England. Um, and unfortunately, I, I think, and, and in an area that voted for Brexit. Regretfully, I, I don't think the, the ground has shifted as much as people might like it to shift. Uh, I think I would agree with the, the gentleman who spoke first in the Q&A session that 
what we need to focus on first is um, an economic offer on the single market and the customs union. But what I would like to talk about is actually engaging in the war of culture and the war of identity, because I think we need to think of this as, and I am one of the younger people, um, we need to think of this as a multi-generational effort that we have to build from the ground up a European culture and for people to see Europe as being part of their culture, not in opposition to their culture, but part of it. And I think one of the things that uh, we can do better, particularly in England, is that everybody knows the EU has been tremendously helpful in preserving minority languages. Um, we have regional dialect and regional culture, uh, and I think we need to find ways of connecting that to the European battle for uh, linguistic diversity to say, we are going to, we think speaking Geordie is important. We want to preserve Geordie. Having your linguistic identity is protected by Europe, uh, not opposed by Europe. Um, and we certainly need to, to sort of start at the bottom, engaging in the war of culture, because we lose culture wars, but if it can be made a culture war, and it being made a culture war causes us to lose, then of course the Tories will do it, and the Eurosceptics will do it. Uh, we can't seed the battle of culture and emotion and identity, but it may involve building up from, from the ground up. And I certainly think, going back to, to what Chico was saying at the end, a mistake we should never make again is saying that we don't want Europeans to engage in our political process. Uh, because we have to normalise that, and that will be a multi-generational effort, but we have to normalise the idea that Europeans are full citizens in our country, and that they have a right to speak, and people have a right to come here and speak to them. So I think one of the things Labour needs to do in the, in the short term is push as an absolute priority for all of our platforms, if we ever get back into government, that we will make all citizens eligible to vote in all uh, elections, and that we will push to normalise as much as we can the idea of Italian MEPs coming over and campaigning here, Italians, Hungarians, Poles, and that people can speak Italian, Polish and Hungarian about our elections uh, and talk about that and that, try and make it seem less of a threat. And I'm not naive enough to believe that that will happen in five years, but we have to have a long-term roadmap uh, that goes in that direction, that builds up the idea that Italians are a full part of our country and have a, a right to vote in all of our elections uh, and that we need to normalise that and centralise it. And I think it's only with that and, and looking at, at this as a sort of a 20-year project that we can then start building towards rejoining the EU. Thank, Thank you, Anna. you, Oscar. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thank you. Really, really insightful. You're right. Um, Michael Elliott, up next, please. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'd like to make two points. First of all, nothing would give me more pleasure than think that one day we're going to be part of the European Union again and have MEPs in the European Parliament. And it's reassuring to hear Anna Colombo talk about maintaining links between the um, socialist group in the European Parliament and those of us uh, campaigning for uh, um, our close relationships with Europe here in Britain. Um, to, that close relationships could be built up and sustained. But I think any future um, um, uh, move to um, get the Labour Party to endorse um, uh, rejoining the European Union has to be linked with a major reform of the European Union itself. It's not exactly been covering itself in glory recently. Uh, I'm not only thinking about the fiasco over uh, the uh, vaccination issue, but as MEP for West London, which I was for the long period in the 1980s and 90s, one of the first things I was involved in was criticism of the European Union for its appalling um, agricultural policies at the time that led to the food mountains. I had two um, cold stores in my constituency full of butter held there to it when rancid. Uh, instead of being given away to pensioners and uh, low-income families as it should have been. We've made some progress. And I think during the time I was there and since, um, the agricultural policy has been significantly reformed, though I think there's a long way to go. Um, and I think this move for reform could be linked uh, with um, a positive uh, attitude toward Britain. We have a lot to contribute to Europe. We've always contributed and I think that um, 
uh, we should stress this point. It's not a question of us wanting to go back into the European Union because uh, just because it's disastrous for us, though in many ways it is, but because we are being denied the opportunity to contribute uh, the kind of thinking that we can effectively contribute to reform of the European Union. As vice chair of the Parliament's Norway delegation, I remember all the discussions in 94 on the Norwegian um, referendum, and we almost persuaded Norway to join. Uh, and Norway is a country that um, uh, is so rich uh, from the oil wealth of the North Sea, it doesn't really need to join with anyone to be prosperous. Uh, but we, our argument, therefore, wasn't just oh, Norway must join or there will be a disaster for Norway. It was what can Norway contribute to the European Union? And we almost persuaded them of that in uh, terms of building up a uh, Nordic uh, grouping to parallel the grouping uh, in the Mediterranean and so on. Michael, I'm sorry, sorry to cut across you. I think we're going to have to wrap you up there because yeah. I'm afraid well, we've still got nine people to come in. If I could with Paul uh, about Erasmus and uh, it's uh, young people in universities today are suffering enough because of the um, COVID crisis. And now they're going to be deprived of the opportunity uh, to participate in student exchange, which has been so successful. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Monica Threlfall. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very impressed with with the amount of people and different sorts of people are, that who have come together. Myself, I've been slightly out of um, not thinking so uh, in such detail about the EU, but um, I have now felt that um, we, the Labour Party, need a strategic vision and that it, we should get to the EU in a slightly roundabout way and, and I'd like to propose this. I think um, the environmental action is the only way forward or a good way forward. Um, basically Labour should become the most prominent um, environmentalists uh, in uh, party and that way we will get to collaborate with Europe. Thank you yeah that's, I think climate change has just got to be it's, one of those issues it, that we uh, we were it's thank the you. main one and and we, yeah. we can't be out out um, you know outperformed by the conservatives it would be shocking. Absolutely okay thank you next over to uh, Sauna Zand. I've I must, oh yeah sorry yeah, got you off you go. Um, yes I'd like to say that we need to be able to connect, as a previous point has been made, we need to connect with pairs, you know, like with through associate membership, being able to de develop joint initiatives as well, so that we can put forward and working with other groups. So another Europe, you know, they're sort of linked as well, or, you know, other, other left group, left unity, other groups to work together to try and bring maybe initiatives that we can put forward and that can improve Europe as well. And I've got to say that we also need, in, in PES and SND, they need to be able to reform the way we are connected with them. Because you can see Vault and DM25, they are having a down up method as well from vote, you know, they're voting through their members and they're voting through people that can represent them as well. I think also there needs to be a lot of, um, issues need to be addressed and that's where um, citizens forum or citizens assembly here and in the EU are needed to be developed. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Sonna. Um, Councillor Chris Burke, Thanks very please much, be as brief as you can. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anna. I'm pleased to see so many people like you here and Dennis and Richard and other people. Um, can, we, can we be positive? Can we be internationalist? Uh, I asked the question from my own perspective and my own work in the labour movement. Can we build relationships at a local government level with European groups and partnerships? Can we build relationships at a CLP level as, as part of bringing our membership to better understand the reality of Europe? We created the European Parliament. The British did that. We are incredibly, intricately, that's the wrong word, isn't it? But, you know, deeply involved in Europe, whatever happens. And I think the, the Labour Party can move forward positively on this issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, David Ellison. 
Hello, hi, I'm it's Dave Ellison. I was a Labour hi, councillor, yeah. chair of planning for Manchester City Council for eight years. I want to, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I wanted to knock on the head the red wall thing. The North, the North did not vote all to leave Europe. The big cities, Manchester, Liverpool, all the industrial areas, Northwest England, they voted to remain, especially around Manchester and Liverpool. And I want to make a British case for remain and rejoin Europe. A lot of the service in 80% of uh, our industries is services, musicians, um, IT, pharmaceuticals. I used to fly into Europe, work in Belgium, Denmark. I designed pharmaceutical plants in my day job. And we need to make a British case why we do that and the exports that that brings to Britain. And Britain is good at it. Britain, Europe wants us over there. And we don't undercut wages, we're providing skills and expertise that works both ways that they need and we need. And I think we need to base the case on that. It's a powerful case and it will work in the industrial areas. Great. Thank you, David. That's great. Um, Anthony you. Kelly. Hi, good evening, everybody. Nobody seems to be talking about Northern Ireland. Um, Boris Johnson has sold Northern Ireland with the DUP down the river. And I'm involved with the peace process in Northern Ireland through my context I work with in videos and stuff. And Northern Ireland's peace at the minute is seriously precarious. We've already had today, we had three UVF terrorists arrested by the anti-terrorist brigade today because they were, you know, parading the streets. And, and the peace process in Northern Ireland is really, really now unstable. And, if, and Boris is a, and the Tory party is not doing anything. And I feel the Labour Party now should be stepping up and actually the, having discussions with old parties in Northern Ireland to try and sort this mess out. And it is a serious mess and it needs to be done urgently. And I think we should, the Labour Party should step up to the plate and do something and say something. Great, Thank thanks. And I'm going to have to make this the last question now, I'm afraid. Um, so apologies for those that just came in towards the end. Brenda Allen. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. My question is really about how Labour nationally gets started, because, as you know, there are criticisms of the leadership for being timid. And despite the fallacy of the Red Wall in the CLP I'm in, they firmly believe that Brexit lost Labour the election. They believe in the Red Wall and they're frightened of being called Ramonas. So really, it's about how Labour fashions a narrative to try and begin a dialogue about ha having closer, more effective links with Europe and also criticising the economic fallout from the Brexit agreement. Great, thank you, Brenda. Um, and I'm really sorry to the last few of you that I didn't get to bring in. Um, obviously, we've just got to go back to our panel for their concluding thoughts before we finish. So um, I'm going to obviously then I won't be able to reply to everything. There's a huge number of points there. So thank you so much for those fascinating contributions and for all the chat as well. It's been brilliant. Um, so, um, but I'll go back to uh, Giacomo. If there's anything that you've heard this evening that you'd like to respond to in your concluding comments. There we go. Sorry, sorry, and I just wrote to the whole group that I had to leave uh, because I have another phone call that I have to make. Tomorrow we have the presidency of the Party of European Socialists in the morning and I have to speak with the president. So no I cannot problem. Uh, elaborate further, but it has been great okay. to be with all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank and, you so uh, much. Let's keep the good work. Definitely. Well, thank Bye. you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. All the best. Thank you. Um, thank Anna, you. would you like to respond? To some of those sec uh, yes now active uh, well um well yes first of all there was a direct question uh, to me uh, on uh, in which way our parliamentary group uh, in brussels i mean the parliamentary group uh, of snd in the european parliament can help and support the parliamentary assembly in the council of europe well, I am afraid we cooperate a lot, in particular on democracy and the rule of law, but there is absolutely no connection whatsoever with the, the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, so we are not able to support the member of that Parliamentary Assembly. But I take the point that, uh, given how things stand, we might try to strengthen our cooperation even further. Um, as far as uh, the uh, um, COP26 in Glasgow is concerned, of course, we accepted its postponement because of the COVID situation, but 
we are, as a, a parliamentary group, as a political group, insisting on the fact that, that this cannot mean in any way uh, weakening the ambitions for COP26, weakening the ambition of the European climate law and the target that we want even to extend to 2030 up to 55%. The Parliament voted 60% of climate neutrality until 2030 in order to reach the full climate neutrality in 2050. Of course, the fact that the US are back is good news, and let's hope that there will be uh, uh, progress. But I would like to say that for us in the European Parliament, and I believe for the Labour uh, movement and the Labour Party too, the point uh, has to be, and Judith uh, uh, can confirm, that uh, there is no ecological transformation without a just transition. And so I think that we have to have everybody on board, and it's even more than just transition. It's not, not to, to urge people, but that the transformation of our economic model has to be a transformation that benefits everybody, because either we are back all together in a new model of development, or no one will be. So let's put in bracket and finalize, let's say, the bracket and the parentheses of Thatcher and Reagan and reinvent a new model altogether. And I hope that, in fact, the COP26 will be an occasion to cooperate together internationally. And finally, to Dennis McShane, I think he is absolutely right. And this is not only for uh, the UK. I think if we want to change our model, it will be policies, and therefore I offered and I accept suggestion to cooperate even in the European Parliament on specific policies. I used affordable housing, child union, an end to austerity, and we can cooperate still all together. But we have to dramatically change the method because the participation has to come from let's say, the grassroots, because only if everybody has the feeling to participate in the transformation, the transformation will succeed. Thank you very much, and I'm you. at your disposal. Thank you so much, Anna. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jude, would you like to, if you could really try and keep your, your speech to, to a minute or so, if you may. Thank you. Oh, hang on. Sorry. We can't hear you at the moment. Are you... Okay. Um, there we are. Yeah, no, I, I will be uh, really quick. I mean, I, I raised the uh, practical examples in the trade union movement of how we're trying to build the cooperation as just that practical examples. I'm not anticipating that European works councils are going to be uh, the mobilizing um, question in Redka or in Middlesbrough or anywhere else. But practical links are extremely important. And in Brussels, there is an open door to the British. Uh, still, there are there are lots and lots of opportunities for us to engage. I think what's striking is that the UK government have act, have committed this act of massive economic damage to the British economy. Um, and at the same time, civil servants in Brussels, they've increased the size of the representation in Brussels to be an enormous super embassy because they want to strengthen the relations. What depresses me is that the Labour Party isn't in Brussels building those relations directly with our counterparts inside the Commission, inside the European Parliament, being present, being visible, because regardless of what Boris Johnson says at the dispatch box or the kind of headlines in the red tops, the UK government are trying to build those relationships and build the bridges behind the scenes. And if we're not doing that work, then we will we'll fall out of the discussion. So we need to be there in every format, local government connections. I saw some of the town twinning example said, local government connections, really important. Trade union connections, really important. Other civil society and our front bench need to get to Brussels, need to learn and get to know their counterparts and find, like Anna said, the common policies where we can talk around a table, not about Brexit, but about something else. And the um, point of COP26 is a massive opportunity um, right. and a massive opportunity for, for the Labour Party to, to put their stamp on the agenda. And at the moment, there's just silence and it's quite depressing. 
Thanks, Jude. Thank you. Laszlo, over to you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, lots of um, um, interesting thoughts which I heard. Uh, I would like to connect with what Dennis as well as Michael said about the need to reform the European Union and correct uh, some of the policies of the past. Um, I think, uh, you know, in this circle, which is pro-European, um, when we are among ourselves, of course, uh, it's very important to, um, to speak about <coughs> what um, uh, needs to be repaired in the architecture of the European Union. Um, I think we agree that uh, Brexit is a folly and Lexit is an even greater folly. Um, however, it, um, uh, Brexit is not a folly because the European Union would be perfect, right? Um, it is a folly because those who actually drive Brexit uh, want to create uh, you know, a, 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 an, an even more uh, neoliberal, um, unregulated uh, type of capitalism, which, which would uh, bring um, uh, most of the British workers into a, a, a much worse situation. Uh, so even the minimum standards of the European Union, if removed, uh, would result in um, a social, to some extent also economic <coughs> decline. On the other hand, there is a lot uh, to do on the European side to prepare, uh, sorry, to prevent uh, that similar tendencies uh, unfold in other countries. So if uh, uh, the various controversies and failures of the EU uh, were exploited this way, uh, for example, through references to the Greek uh, crisis and other uh, 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 problems of the continent, especially the monetary union, um, in order to prove uh, to the British public that uh, the EU was dysfunctional. Of course, we have to counter these arguments and make uh, the EU uh, functional. Um, and, uh, but, but that's also why it's so important that last year, as um, a, a response to the corona uh, crisis, the EU practically reinvented its own budget. Uh, so what has been done last year um, was, uh, was seen almost impossible 10 years ago at the time of uh, the Eurozone uh, uh, crisis which means that um, the EU can improve, the EU can uh, give better answers to uh, economic problems and social problems than in the previous uh, uh, crisis. And the narrative that was built in order to promote Brexit, that the EU is a lost case and it's just um, you know, a hopeless uh, dysfunctional uh, 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 system is simply uh, not true, and um, and uh, and for that uh, kind of critical analysis is uh, is helpful, and um, and and I think uh, you know from the British experience, but also merged with the continental experience, we can uh, develop this necessary uh, critical analysis. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Laszlo. Brilliant. Um, and finally, Paul, I don't know if you'd like to, uh, you obviously won't ask you to sum up everything that's been said tonight or respond to it all, but just to have your concluding uh, remarks, it would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anna. I mean, obviously, there have been a huge number of questions which you can't do justice to, but I have benefited from hearing what, what's on people's minds and all the contributions in the, uh, in the chat. I'll just try and respond briefly to a few points. Um, a couple of specific ones and then a more general one, which I think covers, covers a number of the issues. Uh, firstly, Anthony uh, made a really important point about Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I mean, our, Lou Haig and our Shadow Northern Ireland team are very much onto it. I mean, we're doing a whole, they've been doing a whole series of events recently around celebrating the Good Friday Agreement, one of the Labour government's great achievements. Um, and in the context of the risks, and it reminds people of the risks it's been put under, we pushed within uh, Parliament on the defence of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, but of course, the whole, the whole situation simply um, uh, you know, highlights the duplicity um, of uh, the Tories in pretending um, that they could uh, avoid the three options, which were all the only ones ever on the table for resolving the, 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 the issue in Northern Ireland. Um, but it's a hugely important question. We're continuing to work with uh, parties across uh, Northern Ireland to protect the peace. Um, 
Michael, you asked about Erasmus. Um, I mean, it was one of the uh, six amendments we tabled to the uh, Future Relationship Bill to, to maintain our position within Erasmus. Um, that there is a replacement scheme, it's uh, called Turin. Um, it's not a replacement in the sense that um, Erasmus, of course, was an exchange programme. Turin is a one-way street. Uh, it only gives uh, British students the opportunity to go somewhere else. It doesn't give others the opportunity to come here. And we need to make the case about how much we were enriched by having um, students from across the European continent uh, come into the UK, both culturally and, uh, and financially. We'll, we'll monitor Turin, we'll expose it, and we'll still to make the case for Erasmus. And people were talking about um, involving young people in the labour movement for Europe. Well, that's potentially a campaign um, to uh, involve young people in. Uh, to, uh, to restore uh, the Erasmus scheme. The main question I'll try and answer is the one I think uh, Martin asked first. Um, how can we keep um, our, rela our relationship with the European Union on the agenda? Um, and uh, I mean, I think the answer is events will do it for us. Um, the question is how we respond. And Glenis Wilmot made um, a really important point, as she always does. And it's great to see you on the, uh, on the call Glenis, your leadership of the EPLP um, was, uh, uh, was, was made an enormous contribution, uh, as indeed did your leadership of the party as chair of the NEC. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, it's good to hear, uh, hear, hear your views. You were right in saying um, that there's a need to persuade all within our party. This isn't just an issue of um, the leadership, it's persuading all within our party um, of the need to take up the question of Europe. Um, and to do it without causing conflict within the party. None of us want to do that. That's, uh, that's in nobody's interests. Um, as I said, in relation to, uh, uh, sorry, you also made another really important point, is, which is that we never made, um, under any of our leaders, uh, a successful case for Europe. Um, it was always kind of us and them. Um, we were never fully part of the, part of the project, um, and we embraced those things which, um, actually was sometimes imposed on us um, if they were popular and gave Europe no credit, for, gave the EU no credit. Um, and those things which uh, um, uh, we actually pushed for, if they ever became unpopular, we blamed Brussels. Um, so we've, we've kind of got to shift that mindset. But going back to Martin's point, how do we keep the relationship on the agenda? Events will do it for us, but we have to sh make sure that we shape the narrative because um, I can't remember who said the culture war is over. I'm afraid it's not. The Tories cannot wait for us to start talking about Europe because they want to consolidate that base that they, they managed to get around the issue. And it's true that most Labour voters um, voted uh, to remain, and a, a point I made consistently over the last four years. But there were a significant number who left us over the issue. Um, and the Tories want to consolidate them. So we have to find a narrative which um, doesn't blame them when things begin to unravel, as they will, as we are already seeing, whether it's on fish, whether it's on sections of manufacturing, whether it's on a whole range of issues, doesn't blame people for the way they voted in 2016, but exposes nevertheless that um, those responsible for the Brexit project are, uh, should be held accountable for the things that they said would never happen. But, um, and uh, so we've got, to, we've got to find a language, and I think it's doable, um, which, uh, and Anna's making the point on the chat, that uh, the culture war is very much still raging, uh, and she's right. Um, so we've got to find a language which doesn't fall into the Tories' trap, um, doesn't blame people for the decision in 2016, but nevertheless says that there is a better way that does land those who were responsible for the Brexit project with the responsibility for things that are going wrong and ensures that they don't land that on the uh, European Union, deepening the divisions, um, because our objective has to be um, to be building towards a closer relationship, not only because we're kind of supporters of the European project, because, but because that is in the interest of everybody in our country. Um, however they voted in 2016, a closer relationship uh, is also in the interests of the continent that we, uh, uh, of which we are a part and will always be a part. Um, and I think that Chris made a, made a good point as well, and it was echoed by somebody else, that um, 
this isn't just an issue for the parliamentary party or for the leadership. It's something that we can do at every level. Um, and uh, building positive relationships is something that can be done at every level. There's some exciting things going on in terms of city to city, town to town uh, links. We, um, Jude talked about the, the way that trade unions are continuing to work together. We are embedded as Labour Party members in all of those different uh, uh, organisations. Let's use those opportunities uh, as well as the discussions we're having within the party. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And I'm sorry to everybody that we've overrun um, by, by quite a bit, but it was such a fascinating discussion and with some brilliant contributions and some great exchanges in the chat as well. So I'm really grateful. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of work ahead of us. And we're right at the beginning, I think, of a long, uh, you know, we're at the foothills of a long mountain to climb. But, um, you know, we've if we've got to believe we, and we've had our colleagues there from, you know, across the water showing solidarity with us tonight. And, um, you know, the, the future starts here. So if you're not already a member of LME please do join please subscribe to our newsletters please come along to other uh, events that we have and um, you know we're, we're really proud to have so many of you here kind of participating tonight and particular thank you to our panel as well for all of their insights and um, I just want to say thank you once again and please stay safe everybody and we look forward to seeing you again soon thanks ever so much bye